Good morning. Thank you all for coming. Thanks online audience for joining in and watching on YouTube, whether you're watching live or recorded. Uh, it's the middle of December. The Nobel Prizes are just being given. And this is the last of our Nobel Prize series, Diane Wise. And today we're going to look at the physics Nobel Prize for the year, uh, which is on something called atom second light pulses. Uh, it's a bit difficult, so we will go through it very slowly. And to help us with that is Ankit. Ankit Dulas is a uh, PhD student who works on uh, very short laser pulses. When they interact with matter, very at very high energy, they produce plasma, and then he studies those plasma. But uh, today he's going to tell us about uh, the work leading to the Nobel Prize of this year. So Ankit is from uh, Jin in Haryana. Uh, he did his uh, bachelor's from Delhi, uh, Delhi University and then joined uh, CIFR just after his bachelor's for an integrated PhD program. And uh, he's a final year student. Hopefully, it will be done soon. Uh, just a reminder Chai and I happen, in case you watch this for the first time, Chai and I happen to the first Sunday of every month at the Fifty Theater, third Sunday of every month at the Perel College of Media. If a month has a fifth Sunday, we are live from a lab in uh, CIFR. December 31st is a Sunday. So the last Sunday of the month will have a uh, Chai and I live session from a lab. Ah, oh, thank you. You want it on or off? On, okay. Uh, given that it's the 31st of December, uh, whoever I ask will be saying, I'm away. So uh, we'll see, we'll find the lab, we will be there. And following that, on the 7th of January, the next JNY at 50 is going to look at uh, chaos. Uh, no, sorry, chance. Chance and it's called chance. Uh, it's going to look at the idea of probability and how does probability actually show up? Why is the coin toss probability half? Right? Why is it that half the time you get hit and take? Uh, we think about probability that we've perhaps not thought of. Uh, going a bit details of uh, how do you get chance and how do these events happen? Uh, we have Vasudev that won the uh, another award. Uh, he will be speaking on chance taking. So that's the upcoming trial wise. And uh, with that, Ankit, uh, I think you yeah. should go on. Yes. You can now share your screen. Just a second. Uh, yeah, share screen. Wait, are you shared? Shared. I think. One second. No? Uh, yes, yes. Now it has to be being Okay. <laughs> Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So thank you, Arna, for the introduction and giving me this opportunity. So hello, guys. Yes. Ah. Ah. Okay. So guys, today we are going to talk about uh, something we call as attosecond pulses of light. Okay, so this is the Nobel uh, laureate, Pierre Augustini, Frank Rose, and Anne Lohelier, who received this Nobel Prize for the work they did almost 25 to 30 years back. Okay, so they the work they did was the experimental techniques they developed to create these attosecond pulses of light and then use these pulses to study the motion of electrons inside an atom. And not only that, they op it opens doors for future applications that we will discuss today. Okay, so in the first slides itself, you see there are lots of colors, right? And they are in kind of a randomly arranged with respect to each other. And what they have to do with the topic which we are going to discuss about, probably you will realize at the end of the talk. So, yeah, please come. <laughs> Yes. Okay. So first to understand how small is an attosecond, let's see the general time scale that we daily experience in our daily life. So for example, you have seen the stopwatch, right? 
a stopwatch we use to count seconds right so somebody is going to run you have to count how much time it takes so you run a stopwatch so you you use stopwatch to count seconds you also know about cameras right so everybody is a mobile camera right and you take videos with the mobile camera so how fast you think a mobile camera can capture videos so so it capture frames right multiple images in a second so how many frames it can capture in a second anybody Thousand frames per second. Anybody else? Thirty, sixty, right? So mobile camera usually capture maybe fifty, sixty frames per second. But yes, there are cameras which are really good. They can capture thousands of frames in a second. So they can capture a millisecond of a time. So they can capture thousands frame in a second. So that is a really fast camera. So now everybody have done some chemistry in their schools, right? So you have some chemical reactions. You mix two solutions. It produces some color, right? So those chemical reactions are also very fast, right? It turned out most of them could be at as fast as a million times of a second. So the time scale at which they happen turned out to be million uh, a microsecond. So a microsecond is a millionth of a second. So that is a really really fast. Uh, a simple camera can't capture such a reaction dynamics in time. Now if we talk about the fast electronic gadgets, right? So like mobile phones you carry. And laptops you have, computers you have, right? They are super fast, right? You can do lots of calculation just a moment of a time, right? So how fast you think they are? How many nanoseconds? So, okay, anybody, anybody like to guess? Okay, so it turned out, yeah, the best computer we have, they can do operations on nanoseconds of time scale. And what is nanosecond? So nanosecond is a billionth of a second. So that is an unbelievable fast. Uh, Yes, yes. When I go in this scale, every every event which I talk about is a thousand times more faster than the previous one. Okay, so now this is the best, the fastest electronic gadgets we have. But now it turned out that when we go to explore nature on very tiny scale, and when we look more and more at smaller length scale, it turned out that nature moves on much faster time scale. It turns, for example, the air we breathe in or the air we, the carbon dioxide we breathe out, the molecules inside those the atoms inside those molecules vibrate at much faster time scale, and this time scale turns out to be picoseconds. So you can have this is a thousand of a billionth of a second. So this is a really really rapid time scale. Okay. So now you know photosynthesis, right? Photosynthesis is a process where you plants make their energy to survive, right? Out of sunlight. It turned out in plants also in many other reactions, few of the steps could be as fast as a millionth of a a billionth of a second in a femtosecond time scale. So, well, today what we are going to talk about is way faster than all of this. What we are going to talk about the motion of an electron inside an atom, and it turned out the time scale at which it moves is in attosecond. So, attosecond is a billionth of a billionth of a second. So, this is that short of a time scale. And if you take a simplest atom. So, like uh, oxygen is a the gas we inhale is a combination of two atoms, right? Oxygen atoms. So, if you take the time it takes an electron to complete one circular motion around its nuclear, it turns out to be hundreds of attosecond. So, this is something which you want to probe. But you can ask why we are interested in this, right? Why in the first place we want to probe that? Well, it turned out all the all for example, if you want to develop any technology. First, you have to understand how does how, how things works on the minute scale, so on the quantum scale, how things work. So not only it is important for fundamental science, but as I will show later in the slides, that it is also very very useful if you want to uh, advance your technology for future applications. So it is also very important for that. Okay. So for the future slides, I would like you to remember at least a femtosecond and a nanosecond. So femtosecond is a millionth of a billionth of a second. And an attosecond is a billionth of a billionth of a second. Okay, and to give you an another analogy, how small this number is. So if you consider the current age of our universe, the universe in which we live, if you calculate how many seconds are there in this whole age of the universe, that comes out to be equal to number of attosecond in a single second. So this is a yeah. So this is a kind of a thing uh, we are going to see. Okay, so now. How to see this motion on such a fast time scale? To understand that, let's see how we usually capture motion of the objects in small, some not so fast objects, right? 
So up to nanosecond time scale, that is a billionth of a second, how usually you capture things, right? So usually what do you have? You have a light source, right? You shine this light source on some object, right? And that object reflects the light and that you capture with some camera, right? So eyes are our camera, so the light is coming from sun and it reflecting from the object coming to our eyes, that that's how you image it, right? That is the usual way to capture any object. Now, if you want to, yes, yes. So uh, for the new people, so what I'm going to talk about, I'm just talking about how do you capture the motion of any object. So simply what you do is you shine the light and the light reflected from the object is what you image with the camera. So camera could be actually a camera or you can be your eyes, right? So this is the usual way. But now suppose if you want to record a movie, right? So like you see the fan moving. The way you do it is so inside a camera, there is a shutter, right? The shutter opens and closes multiple times in a second. So depending upon the shutter speed, you can capture more or less number of frames, right? So it is the shutter speed which decides how many frames you can capture in a second, right? So that decides the resolution, okay? So what if your shutter speed is not so fast? For example, if the star is moving really faster than your shutter speed itself, you may not capture it a nice video of it, right? You may see blurry objects. And that is the reason why you see blurry because if your objects are moving very, very rapidly in comparison to your frames, the frames at which you capture the movie, it, it may be seem blurry, okay? So in order to capture a really fast point like this one, so what, what is this? Basically, a bullet is fired that is fired through through an, through an apple. And now this is an incredibly fast camera. So this is capturing 10,000 frames per second. So you have to spend 2-3 lakhs rupees for such a camera. But even though such a camera, it, it's very difficult to see the motion of a bullet, right? So after just few frames, it disappears, right? So in order to capture very, very fast event, you need very high frame rate camera, right? So this is usually how do you capture any event? Well, that is not the limit. The digital electronics have evolved over the years. And now scientists have made a camera which is very, very fast. Like I, I talked about that the fastest electronic gadget is works on nanosecond time resolution, right? But it turned out scientists have developed cameras which can work on picosecond time scale. So it can capture 10 trillion frames in a second. So 10 trillion is thousands of a billion. So in a second, it can open it shutter this many times. The way it works is slightly different. I will go in, not go into depth. But what I will show you is what this camera is capable to do. So everybody knows the light, right? At what speed the light travels? Any, any guess? How much? Right. So 3 lakh kilometers in a second, right? So when you talk somebody to your relative, let's say who is staying in the US on mobile phone, whenever you talk, the information is in an instant goes there, right? All because this is happening at the speed of light. So do you think, is it possible to capture the speed of light with a camera? Can you capture the light as you're traveling with the camera? That is almost an impossible task, right? But this is a camera which is this fast that can capture actually, you can actually see how the light is coming from you to me, how I'm looking at you. Let me show you a video to that. So what I will be showing you. Yes. Okay. So what you are seeing is a green flash of light, right? So there is a glass blo block in which this light pulse is traveling. And this camera is what it is imaging the, how the light propagates. And if I have to play it again, Right? So you can see as the light travels through the medium and then disappears. So now such a fast camera we have, right? But the question is, even a camera which can capture the motion of the light inside, which is this incredible, this fast, is not able to capture the motion of electron inside an atom. So this is something which we are not able to achieve, okay? After the talk, I will ask you this question, why it is that? Why? Because the light is the fastest one. If you can capture that, why not an electron, right? So we'll we'll come to that question later. Okay. So now that's it. That is the limit we have, right? So we can capture nanosecond and picosecond events, but to see now the motion of these atoms inside this molecule, or to see the motion of electron inside the atom, we don't have any camera to capture those events. So now that is the limit. So what is the solution? It turned out this this the solution turned out to be light pulses. Okay. So now you may be wondering about that we use cameras to capture any photo or any record any video, how the light pulses can be used as a camera, right? So how we can use them? Let me show you how do we use them.
which was eliminating the object and the camera a core camera was capturing the light right now what we will do is in spite of using a continuous source of light we will use a pulse of light okay what is a pulse pulse is basically a duration within which the light is confined so the light is coming for a very small duration right so now we want to use a continuous source of a light but we will use a pulse light when this pulse hit the target or the object the object will be illuminated for this short duration right and whatever the motion of the object during that short duration is captured by the camera right so now doesn't matter what is the shutter speed now the i am illuminating the object for a very tiny duration which is decided by the pulse width of the pulse right so in principle if i can make very short pulses i can achieve very good resolution right so that is a basic idea so you make very short pulses in time and you can achieve incredibly high resolution so your camera can be slow it just the light which you are illuminating with that is the short pulse now so that is the basic idea so with that before going to atom second pulses how do we make them let me show you how do scientists actually use these pulses to image real motion of atoms or uh, electrons inside an cloud inside an atom so the technique which we use is we call as pump rope technique okay this is a very simple technique nothing very uh, difficult about it what is a so there are two word one is pump and another is a probe okay so what is a pump so pump is something for example initially you have a bunch of atoms and you shine the pump first. so both pump and probe are pulses so both are pulses so you have bunch of atoms or electrons you shine the pump first. what will pump pulse will do it will bring them in motion so they will start vibrating okay they will vibrate really really fast and now you want to capture this motion right so what we will do is we will bring up another pulse which we call as a probe pulse okay this is again a short pulse this probe will pulse will come and see this motion and we will image that okay and now let me show you the video then it will be better to understand <clears throat> so here is the so this is a bunch of atoms or electrons you can say and this green laser which comes this is a pump pulse so it, it you can see the atoms start vibrating when 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 the pulse is right and this is the motion which we want to capture how does it evolve as a function of time so we will do is a pump probe technique so so yeah so now <clears throat> there are only two pulses first pulse and a second pulse so the first pulse started the motion and the second pulse take a snapshot of whatever the position of the atom was at that instant of a time when the probe pulse comes right now we will repeat the experiment again we will shine a pump pulse set the atoms in motion and a slightly later delay will come and take another snapshot so the probe pulse come take another snapshot so you this way you keep doing experiment again and again you reproduce the experiment basically so in a single go you can't capture but you can repeat the experiment multiple times and you can take snapshot this way you by delaying your probe pulse with respect to pump okay yes please okay so that is the technique which we use and this is a called as a pump probe technique and this is a widely used technique in scientific community whether you go physics chemistry many branches of physics use this kind of a technique so that is the basic idea we use light pulses to image and we image them using this technique so i would like to uh, if somebody have any doubt related to this you can ask me right now because then i will discuss something else yes exactly so this is a very nice question he asked what he asked is if you have a atom second so you have a probe pulse and what you are doing is using this probe pulse to take snapshot now what he is asking is in the next show the next experiment how we are delaying this how we are with what accuracy you can delay this probe pulse with respect to pump is that your question right so that is easy to do actually it turned out to be it is very easy why because light travels with the speed of light right 3 kilometers in a second so now what i can do is in what i can i can add an extra path in probe so for example if i add a path of 1 micron in my probe path it will be delayed by 3 3 femtosecond or 3 arc second so you can add an extra path in probe line and you can delay it with very desired accuracy so there you don't need any electronics so it's just the path you shift the mirror one of the mirror in your setup and that's how you add the path yes so technically yes you have one powerful pulse right 
yes time scale yes right right exactly 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 right exactly right multiply by the same number exactly microns yeah nanometers actually yes and 3 micron is 10 femtosecond okay. right 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 yeah so the yes exactly that is a very another very nice question so his question is yes okay so whatever the earn up pay very short summary to that like it is very easy to control the delay of probe with respect to power pump in our experiment because we have to add an extra path so if you add in a path of let's say 1 cm that will delay my probe pulse to 3 3 nanosecond so the delay you can control with very very high accuracy because there you don't require any uh, electronic devices or something like that they by just by moving one of the mirror inside the setup you can uh introduce very very precise delays now the next question just i will answer to that question so the next question was very nice so what he asked was even though my pump pulse is disturbing the system and set all the atoms inside the motion right now my probe pulses can also disturb that motion right i want to capture the motion i don't want to disturb it right so that the the way we do it is the probe pulse is very very weak okay that is the first and also atoms respond on some frequencies right so there are some frequencies on which atom responds so the probe pulse can have a slightly different frequencies so it doesn't disturb the system at all so th there there are things which you can do about this depending upon system to system so you can keep it very weak in magnitude and also far away from the resonant where the atoms uh, are very uh, yes that is a yes exactly so that is a very nice question so what he asked is how do you control the power of a pump and a probe pulses okay so it will be more clear when i tell you how to make pulses but to decrease the power it is very easy for example uh, what you put is just a filter for example if something is more powerful i you want to make it weak right so you put a filter for example x ray x ray graph you have right so when you put in front of your sun you can block most most of the light inside or your glass is maybe black goggles to you here that also blocks light right some kind of filters you can put to uh, reduce the intensity of light but how to amplify them that is a different physics probably i will touch upon that yeah anything anyone who came later they can ask a question so why that i can clarify okay okay so if not so if i have to summarize we we learn how to make pulses sorry we learn how to use pulses to see very very fast events and what is the technique which experimentalists use basically to see this fast motion though i would like to clarify these are not very similar to like taking pictures like i take pictures of you yours so the this was a very uh, schematic kind of a thing the actual signals are not images they are some signals from which we infer how the dynamics is going to happen Okay. Uh, let's come to the next topic. How to make pulses? 
so you ne- you need to make pulses out of the uh, continuous light beam you have right so how do you make them so any suggestion based upon what do you see yes right 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 nice nice exactly very nice very i will say very intelligent kid exactly so there are two examples given why those were both were fantastic one says what you can do is a laser pointer for example you take a continuous source of light and you pass to a fan right when the fan is moving well fan is not moving there yeah you can see when the fan blocks the light but speed of the fan is not too fast you can't see the chopping actually so the one way is basically you pass your laser beam continuous laser beam via a chopper something like a fan whenever the pulse is blocked by the blade of the fan there is no nothing otherwise there is a pulse right another thing is for example when you have continuous bulb is on right you can see it on see it off right that way you can also produce pulses so both are very nice ways but the problem with these two methods is one you are produce weak pulses why do i say weak because what you are doing is basically whatever energy content you had you are just taking a part of it right that is the one advantage the next is it also depends the the, the shortest duration which you can make is depends upon how fast you can a chop right how fast your fan could be so anybody any guess like for example the fighter planes we have right they have this turbo engine how fast it rotate so it could be 50000 rotation in a second it is that fast even such a fast pin can't produce pulses shorter than nanosecond pulse so that is the limitation so the shortest pulses we can produce is nanosecond pulses but that is of no use because we have cameras to capture that kind of a resolution right well they are useful for some other application not for uh, i will say this. then <clears throat> so this 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 technique uh, just a so we have to come up with a very intelligent strategy not like a simple strategy to make this process so what we do say is the technique is a phase modulation okay so now this may uh, sound a bit uh, dangerous but this is a very simple i will explain so what is a phase modulation so to understand that let's see what is the meaning of phase okay so now suppose there are two person inside a room let's say you both so i have to distinguish between you right so how do i know you are different from him one is simply by your name right your name is different than you right and even if your name is same i can differentiate between them you by your appearance how do you look right so that is the way now if i have to ask you the same question for light photon okay so what is your identity card yes well uh, one you said right amplitude could be i can amplify any photon that way it will be difficult but frequency you use the word frequency that is very nice so the one way as you can see for example i have plotted one and two right these are some light photons i have plotted is the electric field so the light have some electric field like what you have in your home right so the the way electricity work is you have positive and negative half cycles they back and forth uh, switch in time right so you have some light field because of a photon and you see one and two right so you see they look exactly similar but they are defending color right so the color or we say frequency that is the first thing which determines if the two photons or the two light fields are different or not right now but what if i say you that the color is the same how do you differentiate them if they are for example they are identical twins they look very different same and they have the same name let's say then how do you differentiate between them right so well one can have more physical strength than other that way you you develop some some kind of a uh, as a parent you can of course distinguish but how do you do it for photon but for light field that name we use it the phase how do differentiate is basically for example this is some light field i have the same photon or same light field but you can see the peak of one is shifted with respect to the other by some amount right so this amount we call as a phase shift okay so basically the color and the phase shift or you can say phase of a particular color is an like an identity card for if you want to distinguish there can be other properties as well but these are the list two which i am going to be needed for this particular talk so please remember the color of a photon or a light field or the phase of the of that particular color is what distinguishes right and now as 
somebody pointed already that color is also synonym to something we call as a frequency okay so frequency and colors are synonyms you can also i will later in my later part of the talk i will also use an energy of a photon okay so energy of a photon is also similar to frequency or a color okay and the way we measure the energy of a photon is in ev so ev is not an electrical vehicle thank you arna for that <laughs> and so we measure uh, the energy in terms of electron volt okay so electron volt is the unit in which we measure the energy of a photon so when i say color energy or frequency they are similar so the color and the phase are the identity color well so now you know how do you do the phase modulation to make pulses well the idea is very simple what you have to do is you have to take lots of colors okay and you mix them take lot of colors and mix them what do you generate any guess white light well <laughs> these are i hope you, you will say pulse but yes what do you generate is a white light right so the sunlight has lots of color even a tube light has a lots of color so the mixture of colors is a white light not a pulse right so we have to do something special so what we have to do is we have to arrange all these colors in phase okay and if you recall from our last slide phase was what if you choose any peak of a color and you align that that peak with respect to all the colors right so for example the dashed line i show here in the slide is they are locked in phase and when you lock them in phase what will happen is at the point of coincidence where the sorry where all the colors matter so where all the colors are matched for example this point where all the colors are matched you will produce an a constructive interference the light will add together to give you a maxima however at the other other places where the light is not added in phase they will produce minima right yeah so that that way you are able to uh, make a pulse out of uh, different colors by arranging them in phase so i hope that idea is clear so you need lots of colors and you have to add them in phase well not only that so for example if i want to produce more shorter pulses then what you have to do is you have to add more colors for example if you have to produce this much short pulses you need this color this many colors if you want to produce very very short pulses you need more colors okay not only that you have to add them in phase remember this okay well now the question come now you know the idea how to make pulses but how you do it in experiment well the first thing what you have to do is you have to find a way to produce these many colors and the next is how to lock them in phase how to bring them in phase yes yes right so so this 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 is an intensity of this if you see this is a minima right so actually when you add field you produce an electric field which both have both maxima and minima so this this what i plot is the scale of that so that's why i don't have a minima here so yes you are right when you add field you will get minima as well okay so how to produce this many exactly that is one very nice way you can use the white light as a source and put a prism to uh, get all the color well it turned out you can produce them but if you remember there was another condition you have to lock them in phase right the white light by its origin itself the nature of origin itself they are random in phase so it will be very difficult to control their phase so is there any other way you can suggest that is a very nice idea he says like use different colors of laser because for example i have a green laser you use red laser and all that 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 could be one potential uh, way but any anything else well what do we use in actual experiment is there is some kind of a crystal well for the time being i will say this is a magic So inside this crystal, there are lots of atoms, okay, and there are also lots of electrons. The the good thing about this crystal is, when you shine a green light of a pulse on this crystal, what will happen is there are atoms and electrons inside this atom inside this crystal. They will go from ground floor to the top floor. So there are energy levels you see in, on the right side. So it's something you can think of like a ground floor and top floor. So this green pulse comes when we click on this crystal. It will take all the electrons to the top floor. but electron 
who doesn't like to be staying in the top floor they want to come back to the ground floor okay while they come back we either we force them or they come by themselves they will produce different color okay so that is the nice way we can produce many color out of this and now to lock them in phase now to bring them in phase what we can use is a cavity okay what is a cavity for example this laser pointer i use this also works very same way so you have some kind of a cavity so cavity is basically two mirror okay very very good quality mirror and there is a crystal in between the crystal which gives you the color okay so what you do is you pump this crystal with some green light produce this many colors and then these colors go back and forth inside the cavity that's how any laser works and now there is a process we call as mode locking i won't go in detail but that way you can lock them in the phase and you can create pulses out of the cavity okay so yeah uh, i would like to show you another way also so the laser pulses which we create from this technology we use them so you, you don't see anything here right but actually there is a laser beam that is invisible we focus this laser beam in a gas it could be air and after the focus what do you see is lots of color so this is very wonderful like you can produce colors out of thin air so if i focus such a pulse on the on the air molecules it will produce this many color let me just show you a video how it actually happens so this is a laser pulse which is coming 10 pulses in a second okay that's why you see this flashing and it is focused inside an air something like this and you produce all kind of a color okay so you you might think that something very short pulse and you you can use that right that that's how you may think it but it turned out this is where the problem starts so this is not the solution well why it turned out the magic crystal we had which produced this many color can give only up to few femtosecond pulses okay you can't make attosecond pulses out of this but the obvious question is why well there are multiple reasons the first reason so let me uh, before i explain let me ask you anybody know what is the diffraction limit of light you can can you focus the light beam to arbitrary small point okay so let me explain so the property of the light is you can't focus it to a point so the minimum focal spot is de decided by the wavelength of the laser you use so what is the wavelength for example this is a laser light the distance between the two maxima we call as a laser and the time it takes to travel between these two is what we call as a period not the time sorry the time period between these two is what we call as a period of the laser okay so it turned out if you want to make very shorter pulses you can't make pulse a shorter than its half of its period so that is the problem and the magic crystal that we use that gives pulses whose period is around 2 femtosecond so you can't go by nature the the way the thing works you can't shrink the pulse smaller than a femtosecond by the nature itself so you this is we call as a diffraction limit in time so you can't compress the pulse shorter than its half of its period so that is the problem number 1 problem number 2 so well you know you want to make shorter pulses you need more color right well it turned out in order to make at a second pulses you need incredible large number of colors and there is no such crystal which can give you this this huge number of color so that is the problem number 2 not only that so as i told you before that colors and energy are synonyms to each other so the red color have lower energy blue color have higher energy so it turned out in order to make an atom second pulse the amount of energy and for energy photons you need from 1 eV to 100 of eV just to give you a comparison for a femtosecond pulse you need 1 or eV or 2 eV that's it in order to make a atom second pulse you need photon as high as 100 eV okay and to make you realize how high is it so people do x ray right x ray to see uh, any fracture in your bones and this so these high energy photon we call as x rays is used to image your bones so that is very high energy photon and there is no crystal to produce this kind of a photon so that is problem number 2 not only that you saw a cavity inside a laser right that had a mirror now if you pass such a x ray pulse x ray frequencies inside this mirror cavity they will just pass through right as if they pass through your body they will pass through the cavity so there are no optical element which works on x ray so that is a big challenge so neither you have color neither you have cavity which can hold this color this is a big problem now and 
on top of that how to lock them in place that is another level of a problem well this so this is like a mountain of a problem and you want to solve them to make this at a second pearl so this is where the contribution of our three nobel laureates came they accepted this challenge that we will do almost 25 years to 30 years before okay so let me talk about the contribution of our first nobel laureate anne lohle so she this nobel prize also uh, pretty nice because she is the fifth woman to win this nobel prize in physics basically she was born in 1958 in paris she is a french scientist and it turned out she did dual degree in master she studied theoretical physics and mathematics but switched to experimental physics in in, in her phd so obtained his phd in experimental physics so she is the person who is basically started this field you can say so this is her first paper which started this field paper was published in 1987 so almost 30 more than 30 years before i think yeah so what she was doing is in her phd she was working on if you shine any light pearl or a, any any photon on an atom okay on a microscopic atom for example air has lots of atoms right when you shine any photon on an atom how does this atom respond to this light that is what she was studying well let's see what was his contribution what was her contribution sorry okay so usually when you have some atom there is some electron attached to it right because atom has a nucleus which have a positive charge and electron is negative charge so that's how they are attracted to each other and that's how they orbit around each other right so now when you shine in continuous light beam for example this laser pointer i shine on some molecules or some atoms let's say the energy of a photon or a color of a photon the energy is 1 e okay and now this electron has a two energy level one is this and another is this so something like electron has a ground state and another excited state okay and the energy gap is let's say 1.5 eV which is larger than the energy of a photon okay so what do you expect when such a photon is incident on the light electron it it won't be able to give it sufficient energy right so that it can go to the upper state it right? so it has to get energy higher than this in order to go to excited state right so what what you expect is nothing like a normal scattering light will go light won't be absorbed absorbing light means electron will go from ground state to upper state because it doesn't have any sufficient energy it won't go right so this is simple scattering of light and that is why you see a blue sky so light is simply scatter well what anne lohle was doing was not shining simple light like a continuous source of light what she was shining was pulses okay even though pulses have same photons photons of same color with same energy one eV in energy but <coughs> so you should expect the same thing right so electron won't absorb any photons because the energy is not sufficient high to excite it to excite it state right so it will stay in the ground state but what she observed was something really really surprising very surprising and not known at all by that time what she observed was in output in spite of getting the same color photon she get lots of color she got color with energy as high as hundreds of eV the input photon has 1 eV in energy but in output it gets 100 eV in energy so that was like no physics there was no understanding and non physics no theoretical model so how do you understand the physics well just to give you a nice analogy about this if somebody like music play guitar so guitar has a string and there is a bow when you hit the bow on the string so depending upon the length of the string you can excite different notes right so the So the wave can propagate inside the string and you can have all these overtones we say in music right so you can hear all these uh, overtones in the sound wave right so something similar to observe into the uh, experiment so here basically atoms were boiling atoms were acting as a boiling and your laser pulse which was exciting this was ex so this laser pulse if i do so this laser pulse i will call this pulse as a pump pulse for my future purpose so this this laser pulse which is a pump pulse which is acting as a bow and the atoms inside the gas is acting as a boiling so when you stick this laser pulse on this atom you see something similar when you see in the sound wave you see but these are in the light so in the light you produce these many colors so that is an analogy yeah now if you want to advance this if you want to go further you have to understand what is this how do you produce these many colors so that is the basic idea well this is the man who gave a very first theoretical model a very simple one very easy to understand what did he say so initially inside an atom you have a, a positive nucleus and electron right it is orbiting around the nucleus 
so you can describe this thing very similar for example you have well okay and inside the well you have seen those games inside the circus right motor bike going inside a big circle or something right so most ka kuwa karke there is a thing so you you have a well and inside this there is an electron which is moving around okay so that is usually the way it is now what happens is when you shine the light pulse on this particular atom on the electron what happens is light field is a strong electric field and because of this initially you were put in well was like this now because of electric field it will bend so you see this bending so this is the bend in the potential well and this spherical particle you see is an electron okay so now the electron is so if if, if you see this matrix this bending is there and now electron there is a chance for an electron to come out of this well so now particle can come outside this well because of this bending well this is not very classical in the sense if i have to explain you let me give you an example for example if you have ball and you hit the ball on the ball what will happen the ball will come back to you right even if you do it a million times every time ball will come back to you but the electrons are very bizarre particles so they doesn't behave very classically like a ball what can happen is when you throw an electron on a ball it may come back but when you do it a million times it may happen that once in a million time it can cross the ball so this affects we call as a tunneling so quantum tunneling so the electron going through a potential even though its energy is lower than the potential energy the energy it required to tunnel so you can see the electron is inside so there is a wall here but still it can tunnel through this wall and can come outside okay so this is what happens now what happens is now as the laser field changes its direction electric once it is outside it can be accelerated you can supply its energy via laser pulse it can gain the energy so once it ionizes it, it has zero energy but now because of the laser field it will gain its energy and energy can become to 100 so change okay now what will happen is now initially laser field was positive then it will become negative electron was going 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 and when the field become negative it will come back okay so this will come back and now it may happen once in a million times electron can combine with original atom so from here it was released it can it can be accelerated it can accelerate and then come back combine with original atom and when it combines it produces a very high frequency photon why because it gained lots of energy when while it was getting accelerated and now it it combines it has to release that energy so these energy are these high energy photons so what anna lohelia and her group measured was these were the these high energy photons so depending upon what trajectory for example it can go this way it can go slightly this way or it can go this way right depending upon the path it takes it will emit different color so th that was the basic model this is a three step model very easy to understand first potential is bent electron tunnel outside electron accelerate come back recombine and produce this high energy photon so this was the idea so well now you don't need a magic crystal right which will give you these many colors now what you need is a single atom and a single electron that's it and you can produce all the colors you need to make an atom second pulse right the original idea is yes right so what very nice question so you are asking about why don't you get continuous light light ah ah right 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 so what she was asking is when you were shining continuous beam of light why this process did, didn't happen why only when you shine a light pulse the answer for that is this the bending of the potential well in order to bend this you need a very very large electric field very very large electric field and when you have continuous beam of light the electric field is low when you compress this whole thing into a very tiny pulse the electric field boosts so you produce very very high electric field and that electric field is able to bend this potential okay so that's why you need a, a very very small so yeah very nice question well now you have all the colors in the world right so you can make an atom second pulse right but the same group anel holy and her co-worker kagas shows that all these colors are random they are not in phase at all so if you recall our criteria to make a pulse you need all the colors in phase what she showed was all these are in random there is no sync there is no thinking in between this color so now this becomes a very difficult problem so this is where how to do the phase lock so this is where the contribution of our second nobel laureate so pierre vasini so he was born in tunisia in 1941 he was also a french scientist 
So he did masters in physics in 1952 and obtained his PhD degree in experimental physics in 1968. What he showed was, for the first time, experimentally he demonstrated that you can produce at a second pulses, not a single pulse, but a train of them, a multiple pulse, a sequence of multiple pulses. So he is the famous paper. It is the famous paper he published in 2001 in Science Journal. Okay. Not only that, he also showed. So now, if I have to ask you, well, not only that, he also showed. He is also called as the father of rabbit. Well, this is not the same rabbit as you might be thinking. This is a technique he developed to measure these short pulses. So not only he showed that there are actually at a second pulses, he also developed the way to measure them. So in this part of the next part of the talk, I won't be discuss, able to discuss how to do this phase locking because that will be too technical. But I can take questions after the talk. What I will be talking about is how to measure them. Well, if I have to ask you how to measure the length of any object, let's say this, how do you measure the length of this? Any 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 suggestion? Any idea? Use a scale, some scale, right? Use some scale and see how much it is, right? But suppose if my size of the object is smaller than the smallest tick of the scale, so in scale you have one centimeter, one mm, right? There are ticks, right? So if my object is smaller than the smallest tick, can you measure it? But we we how do we use? So in order to measure anything, we need some calibrated source, right? So we need something which which, which we have a calibrated source which, which we can use to measure it, right? These pulses of light are the shortest ones. So no, there is no calibration like this. These are the shortest ones. We can use this to measure something bigger. But these, since these are shortest, how do you measure them? So that was a very big challenge. I hope you understand this. So just to give an analogy, one more time. For example, I have to measure this. I use a scale and see how many one centimeter, two centimeter. This way you can measure. But this thing is so tiny that any smallest ticks in your any scale that you have is bigger for this to measure this. So that is the problem. So now how to measure? So well, he said that light pulse is nothing but lots of colors arranged in some phase, right? So in principle, if you can measure all the colors and the phase in which they are arranged, you can measure the pulse. But how to do that? So basically, you measure the colors and the phase they are arranged in. Now, can you suggest me how to measure colors? Yes. So what you are saying is you take wavelength of a color as a scale, right? But what I'm saying is the pulse itself is much shorter than that wavelength. Well, you might be suggesting something. We'll discuss that that later. But uh, how to measure any color? For example, light, sunlight have some colors. How do you measure them? You suggested something before. Put a prism inside that, right? Go pass through that prism, right? Prism will separate all the colors. You might have used prism in your school, right? So that is the easiest way. Well, this is the same idea which they use, but you can't use a prism for X-ray pulses. So something we call as a grating target. Grating is I don't know if you are familiar with, but the basic idea is same. So you disperse colors in space and then you measure it. So that is the basic idea. How do you measure space? That is a very important and very difficult to do. So. The answer to that is an interferometer. Okay, so now I am bringing another technique. Well, this is again a very simple technique. Interferometer is a device you can say basic or a technique which can use to measure space. Okay, the way it works is how many of you know about Michelson interferometer? Thank you. Michelson interferometer. Okay, so well I I will explain this. So this is a very simple gadget. You can say set, set of optical elements. Which we use to measure the phase. How does it work? Is so you see there is a light source. Okay, this is a you can see it. It can be a laser source. It it emits laser beam and then you have a beam splitter. So beam splitter is nothing but a glass plate. You can see. So what will happen is when you shine the laser uh, laser beam on a glass plate, a part of it will be reflected, a part will go through it. Right. So some part will be go and so this is the transmitted part and this is the reflected part. So the transmitted part will go to a mirror. It will also go to a mirror. So after hitting the mirror, it will come back exactly the same way. So the light will go, 
come back in the same way it will go and come back and they will combine at this particular plate okay so now let's see how does it work so you see the light beam is emitted right it going both way one is transmitted and is reflected so you see this is light beam is reflected from the mirror and then it comes back and now it is coming to this thing right but you, you don't see any light beam here right as you see the red color you don't see it here why because you see they are out of phase the maxima of is lying on the minima of the other when when the maxima of one lying on the minima of other there is no light and when the maxima are lying there is a light right how we do that basically you move one of the mirrors as you move one of the mirrors this 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 will happen right so maxima of one can align with the maxima of other and you will produce light so what you can do is just by moving one of the mirrors this so the light wave interferes with each other to give you maximum or minima. So by measuring how the light is coming on the screen, you can talk about the phase because you know when they are in phase, you have maximum light, and when they are out of phase, you have minimum light. So this is the idea. So you interfere two light waves to see what are their phase, right? So that idea is very basic. Well, it's not so easy to implement. It turned out because you you are using X-rays, you have X-ray energy photons in your pulse, right? So how to how to measure their interference? Well, I won't go in that detail. But the basic idea what he used was not to use interference of light photons, but to use interference of electrons. Well, what are these electrons now? What he did was he focused his X-ray pulses or uh, or, or attosecond pulses on some gaseous atoms. It ionized the electrons, and the electrons then interfere to give you the phase. And this is what he showed. So you see this train of multiple pulses, right? One, two, three, and four. So this is the train of uh, at a second pulses. He showed for the first time to the world that you can produce pulses as short as 250 at a second. And they are produced every half cycle of your pump laser. If you remember, there is a pump laser which you are heating on the molecules, right? So in every half cycle, you produce a one at a second pulse. So this is the way he did it. But it turned out, if you remember my initial video where I show you how we use pump probe techniques to measure the dynamics of molecules, right? There we need a single probe pulse, right? But what do we have is a train of attosecond pulses, right? So we can't do an experiment with this. So we need to have, we need a way to control these reparate, or we need to produce a single attosecond pulse to do that experiment, right? So we are able to delay it with respect to pump and see how the system is evolving, right? So now how to produce a single attosecond pulse? So this is the way where the contribution of our third novel it came. Ferenc Gross. So he was born in 1962 in Hungary and he did his master's in physics in 1962 and 1991 he obtained his PhD degree in laser physics. So he is the guy who showed for the first time how to produce a single atom second pulse, not a train of them. Well, he published his first paper in Nature 2001, almost at the same time when Pierre Augustine published. So they were totally independent group doing research in both things. One published how to produce at a second pulse train of them and he published how to make how to produce a single isolated at a second pulse not only that the technique which Pierre Agustini was using to measure the train of at a second pulse is, can't be used to measure this so he has to develop a new method to measure how to measure the single at a second pulse so he also produced a technique how do you measure such small event well uh, i will just give you an idea overall idea that how to produce a single at a second pulse if you recall, the train at a second pulse was produced in every half cycle of the pump laser, right? And every half cycle there was a one at a second pulse coming. So what if you use in a pump laser only one cycle? Right? In a pump laser, if you don't have multiple cycles, only have one cycle, then there will be one at a second pulse, right? So that's a very simple idea. Well, producing this one cycle pulse is very difficult task. That's what they did, and you can achieve a single at a second pulse. Well, this is not exactly what he did. He did something slightly different. If I have to uh, summarize this very quickly, what I will say, so you can see when he focuses laser light on the gaseous atom, the blue, what you see is an attosecond pulses or all the colors which I was talking about. Well, this consists a train of attosecond pulses, which I show here. It turned out one of them is maximum in intensity. What you can do is you can put a filter. You put a filter so that the rest of them are blue, only one is coming. Right? So you produce an atosecond second pulse this, this way as well. Well, it turned out because of the filtering, the pulse is also getting affected. And he showed that the pulse now you produce is around 650 atosecond. 
So Pierre Augustin showed you can produce 250 atoms second pulses, but this pulse was slightly broader. But now you you have ways to control that as well. Yeah. So this is a graph I will show you. So on the y-axis, on the vertical axis, what I show is the pulse duration of a laser pulses, and this is the year in which they were invented, right? So you see, after just after the invention of lasers, 1960, all the way to 1980s, there is an exponential advancement or research in technology development and uh, laser development. But after 1980s to almost 2000, there was it, the field was almost saturated. Now because of their work, whatever they have done, now you see another exponential increase in the development of these lasers and the related uh, research and science. So this, this what they have done is really remarkable. So. There are some very light uh, sounds, but of course we are using them to study fundamental science. But in future, we expect them to have some more potential uh, applications. For example, you know, all over electronic gadgets also nanosecond time scale, right? But in principle, you want more and more faster gadgets, right? You want your computer to be extremely fast so that you can do much, much more with that, right? So the one way scientists are proposing is what you can do is. For example, inside uh, your computers, there are semiconductors, right? You control the currents inside the semiconductor, that's how your computer works. What you can use is, you can use attosecond pulses. When you shine attosecond pulses on your, like some semiconductor, it can create charged particles like electrons and holes, which will be created on those time scales. Not only that, you can uh, control these dynamics of these electrons using attosecond pulses. So you can generate part charged particles, you can control them using attosecond pulses. That way you can produce electronic devices, which can be almost a million times faster than your first supercomputer that you have. So this is a research in progress and people are doing that. Uh, another very, very important application for this technology is for the drug development. You know, uh, for example, for the COVID, you have developed some vaccine, right? So you want to develop more and more vaccine to cure your disease. But how a vaccine is developed is basically you know, on the fundamental level, you study the interaction of these molecules, how they interact, how the different reaction happens. What do you want to, there will be a big help if you can understand the fundamental nature, how the, in the real time, how this reaction is happening. And now because you have at a second pulse, this, what is, how do you, how, yep. you can explain how the sound is going over across this atom lattice. And that is a fantastic, I will say, because from that point of view, you can develop our drugs very, very nice. So you solar cells, right? Now we are going to renewable energy sources, right? So you don't have coal and all. So you want to make more and more efficient uh, devices which can convert solar energy to light. So it turned out the plants use photosynthesis, right? So photosynthesis is a very nice way to convert solar energy into the energy which plants use. So not all, so photosynthesis are many steps. It turned out few steps are very very efficient, right? So you, if humans are not able to do it with such an efficiency like plants do, the nature do it at its own way. So we, what we want to do is we want to understand how the plants are doing it. So once we understand that, we can implement that in our existing uh, electronic devices or like uh, solar panels we have. So we can make them more and more efficient so that we can do better energy harvesting. Yeah. Yeah, so there are many more applications, but to that I will just. So if I have to summarize this whole talk, what you learn is basically, you know, a way to watch the basically at a, at a second dance of electrons inside an atom. So what is the technique if I have to ask you? Recall what is it? There's a technique which we discussed to watch this motion on ultra fast time scale. Exactly. So pump probe was the one which we used, right? So I hope you will remember. Not only that, we also learned how to make pulses, right? So if I have to ask anybody how to make pulses. Yes. Yes. Right, exactly, exactly. So what you have to do is add more and more colors, but add them in shape, otherwise you will produce a white light. So this is basically the key thing. And then NLOVLA came, he produced from a single atom. You don't need any crystal. Take a single atom from an air. Take a single atom and a single electron can give you all the colors in the world. So this is what she showed. So this was very fantastic work. And then the, the Pierre Augustine showed that you not only colors, you can also lock them in space and you can produce a train of them, train of an attosecond pulse. And then things show how to produce a single attosecond pulse and how do you measure them. So 
this is the I mean their contribution and thank you so much and with that i would like to thanks arnab and ulas also for giving me this opportunity to yes now you can ask me okay okay so online audience you can ask the questions exactly so this is a very wonderful question asked so somebody is asking let's say some electron is ionized from an atom can you measure how how quickly it happens right so that is the first what this scientist demonstrated with this technique so now what you can do is because now you have an atom second of resolution you can actually see live how the electron are getting ionized and how much time it takes so the way people did it is so for example you have an two electron right so now what you do is you excite the atom second pulse it ionizes one electron it also ionizes another electron so what you can measure is the relative delay between them right and that delay can give you an accuracy with which the dynamization time yes so of course they can be measured yeah so if there are more questions on the online you can ask type in and otherwise we can take an offline question later okay yeah yeah after that please come and ask questions i will be very happy to 